Welcome to Between Over and Next with your hosts, Holly and Robert, a happily married couple who explore the space between what was, what is, and what's to come. From career changes to navigating life's uncertainties, this dynamic duo will empower you to live your happiest life at every age and stage. So get ready because your journey with Holly and Robert starts now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Between Over and Next. Hi, Holly. Hi, Robert. So another guest from way back when. I like how you go back into our archives and pull out from that archive guests for our new podcast. Well, they're the best. You've done it again. Thank you. Well, they're the best of the best. And this is one featured guest that I was persistent (laughs) in inviting her to be a guest. Carol Brees is a PhD. She is a relationship social scientist, an author, a speaker, and a radical encourager, Robert. Yep. She has been on TED Talks, but she was on Wedding Podcast Network. That's right. On Lovecast. On Lovecast in February of 2008. Something that really matters to us collectively is... Um, having happier, healthier, strong, loving marriages yep. and relationships. Mm-hmm. And that is something we want others to um, learn more about because there's not one quick fix or one thing that makes relationships survive and thrive. No, it's clearly a combination of things and there's no one combination that unlocks the secret to a happy marriage. I think different marriages require different combinations of things. And there's more than one way to make someone happy. I think that people need to look upon this as something that is definitely attainable. And I think as you listen to Carol, it'll become clear that it is completely possible to be A happy couple. When we first met Carol, it was when she authored the book, What Happy Mm -hmm. Couples Do. So anyone watching on YouTube can now see the cover of this book. I will have a link to it in the show notes. Carol has been studying how families, couples, and members of all relationships create joy, happiness, longevity, and connection through the micro moments and the rituals of life. So, meet Carol. Hi, Carol. We're so happy you're here today. Oh, my gosh. It's good to see you both again. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy we're reconnected. And I knew when we started this podcast, Between Over and Next, I knew I wanted you back. When we started Lovecast on Wedding Podcast Network and your book came out, What Happy Couples Do, it was a perfect fit. And 16 years later, it is still something so, so important to all of us regarding having stronger, healthier relationships. Is it 16 years? You heard me right. It's oh, my 16 gosh. 16 years. It, it, we were kids back then. When we met, when you published and authored What Happy Couples Do, I knew I wanted you to share more wisdom about that because at the time we were all collectively married what was that 1992 to 2008 16 years Mm -hmm. so 16 years later we're all married 32 years oh i can do that math yeah (laughs) i mean that's really pretty good right Uh, uh, yeah we all are doing the work that's why because it's loving you know, work and investment and we're doing it. And so I'm happy to be here today to hopefully inspire others to keep doing the work. I loved your TED Talks called Our All Relationships Messy. I watched it a few times. You said there was no drive through marriage or minute clinic for family drama. <laughs> you also said research shows that we all can live longer if we attend 
to the quality of our relationships. So I would like you to tell everybody a little bit about your background and your specialization in being a relationship social scientist. Oh, well, it's my favorite thing to talk about next to talking about my kids and my husband and my dog. So I'm sitting right now in central Minnesota. I am a scholar in residence at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. So we're up here in central Minnesota, St. Joseph, Minnesota, anyone who ever been to our beautiful state. My background here, my home office is a little bit of reflection of, of how I got into this work. My undergraduate work was in art. And, and then I transitioned to a master's and a PhD studying the art and science of relationships because I'm so fascinated by all of the research. I mean, of course, my own experiences, but the research which shows that the single best predictor of not only how long we will live, I mean, soak that in the single best predictor of how long we will live, but also how joyful, how happy and healthy we will be is the quality of our relationship. My PhD work was in this area focused on marriage and family and these little moments. What the evidence shows just these little micro moments that make all the difference in how our relationships are going to evolve. I feel like I have the best job in the world because this matters to everyone, right? I like how you phrased it, the art and science of relationship, because there, there really is that component, the science that we know that there are certain things that happen, physiology that goes on, and that there's that part that we have still yet to shape and that we have the potential to shape based on who we are as individuals and as couples. And I think in order for there to be a successful relationship, I think there has to be a balance between that art and science of any relationship. One of the other metaphors that I really embrace and we try to live and I try to teach often is that marriage is an ongoing conversation and conversation is an art. The art of wanting to make sure that all people in the conversation feel valued, are heard. It's one of our greatest needs as humans is to be a part of something bigger than ourselves, to be in relationship with others. So this notion of marriage and family being a lifelong conversation that's never over and gives us the opportunities when we don't do it well, because even those of us who study communication, who invest our, our lives in, in flourishing marriages, aren't going to always do it well. So conversation gives us the chance to say, you know what, can I do that over? Or I, I, I want to say that a little differently. And, and what a great lesson for marriage, right? The do-over. You mentioned micro moments and rituals, which was featured in your book, What Happy Couples Do. And it is something that is part of your DNA. So as a relationship researcher, you've highlighted the importance of small interactions or micro moments in relationships. Can you share some examples of these rituals and how they build joy and connection in long-term partnerships? It's one of my favorite questions, Holly. So I'm glad you're asking it. I'm going to just provide a tiny bit of context without going into a lecture, although it's tempting. When I first started sort of excavating and a, a, attempting to dig into sort of the core micro dynamics of what creates the best marriages and the best relationships across all time and space and cultures, I came upon this notion of relationship ritual. And what started to intrigue me is this notion that all of us as humans are drawn to ritual because rituals give us comfort. There's a predictability in them. And ritual is all about meaning. This notion of these micro relationship rituals, when we think about them, we have to think about the fact that if something is important to you and me as a ritual of connection in our relationship, in our marriage or our friendship, or our family, it's because we've given it meaning, right? Rituals of connection for couples are so profound because 
They are these little moments that exist in all of our relationships, whether we name them that or not, that give us just this little chance to connect with each other and to say to each other, you matter, or to turn toward our partner without having to say, hey, I'm attempting to connect with you now. We have hundreds and hundreds of rituals couples have shared with us over the years. For instance, one couple shared that they make sure that at the end of the day, when one comes home from work or whomever gets home first, that they just set everything down and they hug each other for at least 20 seconds. And if it gets cut short, like 15, 16 seconds, the dog or the kids or whatever, you know, interrupt, they're like, nope, we're counting to 20. It's those kinds of little intentional moments that really are the rituals connection that build the foundation of our relationships. And often we don't recognize how powerful they are until they're gone or we stop doing them for some reason. I I would love for you to give just a few examples because I do think some people get lost in figuring out what that ritual could potentially be. Robert and I text each other when we're not together or when we are together. We kiss every day at 4.20 p.m. Eastern Mm. Standard Time. And I will tell you, there are some times that we'll say, okay, well, we're going to kiss now and it's 4.20 Central Time or Pacific Time. We are very aware of the moment that we do that. And that's just one example of what we do. I know that I will take Mm -hmm. his hand and hold his hand and saying, I got you. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. Those are just a couple of mine, but I rather know from you, from having researched thousands of couples, what a few of the more popular ones are that others may not have thought of. There's so many, and they reveal the incredible creativity of couples. There was a couple who shared in one of our interviews that they created this little nightly ritual before bedtime, a little game just for them um, of checking each other's belly buttons to see if there was any fuzz, like the blanket fuzz, lint fuzz in each other's belly buttons. It became this cute little like, oh, do you have any fuzz? And became this game over time where you know they like, have you checked my belly button? And Holly and Robert was so interesting because I was sharing that story in a a presentation I was giving about what happy couples do to a room full of couples. And there was this couple that could not contain themselves. They're they're like nudging each other, raising their hand and laughing. And they shared that they had the same exact game that they developed in their marriage, but it had a twist. They kept the fuzz in a little jar. Keep saying, I know. And what I love about this story so much in this ritual is that to say this to a group of of couples, most of them are like, ew, or like when I share it with my students, they're like, disgusting. And what it reminds us is that what's disgusting to you as a couple or not that interesting, not a moment of connection or turning toward, has great meaning to the next couple, right? So it's how we choose to continue to invest little moments of positivity, little moments of joy and meaning that we're weaving together with each other. There was another couple that were in a tight budget. So they had agreed we're not going to buy each other anniversary cards or birthday cards because it's like eh, three, four bucks, you know. And so they would go to the corner store together or Target or wherever, and they'd walk through the card aisle And they each pick out a card that they would give to each other if they had the $5 to spend. They'd come together in the aisle and say out loud why they picked that card and what they would write in it. I love that because it also gets to the notion that these rituals of connection do not have to cost a dime. They don't have to be date nights. They don't require babysitters. Another couple said that they hid their favorite ice cream. They had kids, right? They put the kids to bed. They hid the ice cream in the basement freezer underneath all of the frozen vegetables and meat. And after the kids went to bed, 
They met on the basement floor and ate the ice They're cream. Smashed. They're ice cream. Smashed. I love that. And then they just talked, right? It was the only moment in their day when it was quiet and it was a connection moment. Why is that so important? Why is playfulness so important? Mm. Love this question too, Holly. The long short answer is that we have to continue to not take ourselves and our marriages too seriously while also simultaneously investing in them as if they are the serious thing that they are. Right. We as humans, we learn to play as kids. Play is our primary way of learning and brain developing. And then over time, we kind of unlearn the notion of play. And yet we all need it. So we know that from the research, the happiest couples, those that flourish, are those that time and again figure out ways to integrate joy, little moments of beauty. So if play isn't the word you want to use, what are those little moments of, of delight? There was a couple who shared when they went grocery shopping or on any errands, they had this little game where they parked the car and they got out of the car. And the minute the doors closed, they raced to see who could get to the front door first. And they just they giggled. We know now more the physiology of that too. A shared delight means a shared set of endorphins in your body. And then you get to share it with each other. It's a powerful moment of experience. I always say that it's never too late to have a happy childhood. Mm. And I think that by incorporating just these little moments, these little mm -hmm. things that might seem silly to the outside world, helps keep you in that state of being young, young at heart, young in mind, right? Because we tend to forget what it was like to just play. We love to go bowling. We love to play card games and board games. You just like we did when we were kids, we stopped into a, a whole store that had a whole wall of games that were geared not to children, but to adults, whether it be puzzles or or something like that i think that tied to childhood and, and one of the things that you talk about is the whole nickname <laughs> thing and the secret language the inside joke that we've all done and experienced that all originated from childhood right yet we seem to forget that as adults absolutely i'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it is the most asked about study that i've ever published it started as my master's thesis published in 91, and it was this very simple study based on the notion that private language exists for all couples, whether it's a nickname or some word that has meaning just between you and me as a couple or in our family, or if it's something more elaborate, maybe it's a phrase to help us resolve conflict, but we all have this kind of private language. And this original study that my graduate advisor, Dr. Judy Pearson, and I studied looked just at private language and its connection to marital happiness. I talk about it in my TEDx Minneapolis talk. What we found was that the couples who had more of this private language were also happier. I mean, it was a pure correlation, but when you zoom out on this research and the body of research, which looks at how important rituals of connection are for couples, it all makes sense. because. These moments of language sharing are little moments of ritual. And they do a whole host of really profound things for our marriages. They build a connection. They bond us. They say to the other person, I know you in a way that no one else does. They often are playful. In decades of research, I've collected a lot of data, me and, and colleagues, and the nicknames that people will share for their partners are just, if they don't make the couple laugh, they will make everybody who's listening laugh. They're so creative. Puddin', peeper, poochie, pookie, poo bear, bunny doll, patty poo, buttercup, corn chip, Colonel Sanders, love cheese, big daddy rabbit. They just go on and on. And a lot of couples also develop nicknames for each other's body parts. 
for, for many couples, intimacy, uh, sexuality is it, hard to talk about. So the nicknames help, but it's also playful. People were naming each other's private parts. They were naming sexual intercourse and sexual activity. So I give couples a lot of credit for finding joy in the language. I'm curious, where does a compliment fall? into this language because I think it's very powerful and I think it feels good. And I, and I mean both ways. You look handsome today. Another ritual is he loves when I play with his beard. Nope. And that's only for you YouTubers to see what I'm doing right <laughs> yeah. now. But when he says to me, you look beautiful, but you look so young today. And I take that as a compliment because I feel young. Age is just a number. But also it just lifts you to another place and also because of the person it's coming from. Everybody loves a compliment, right, Carol? So where does that fall into this conversation? Oh, I love it. A, a perfect segue to one other thing that I, I really wanted to talk about today. So I'm often asked by whether it's an 18-year-old student, right? I work on college campuses or couples that have been married 50, 60 years or everyone in between. I'm like, Carol, what what do I need to know about having a flourishing relationship? And I love the question, right? Because it means that people want to know and want to do the work. And what I would say if I had to only pick one thing is I would say our marriages, our relationships need daily deposits in at least three areas. Daily deposits. And deposits mean you're doing this intentionally. One is affirmation. You were just asking, why does it feel good? We all want to be appreciated. We want to be seen and valued, and especially from the person we've committed our lives to. Because over time, what we tend to do in marriage is we start to take each other for granted, right? We come in, we scan the environment for what's not going right, or we notice that our husband's chewing with his mouth open. That's a just random example, not anything to do with my honey. But imagine if we just committed to twice a day, scanning the environment and just saying one thing, affirming the other person, honey, your beard is so trim. Thanks for dropping off the packages at the post office. Those little deposits of affirmation will do more over time for your marriage, right? Because they add up and they seem like, oh, does it really make that much difference? Early in our relationships, we tend to do a lot of that and then it dwindles. The second thing, so our relationships need these three daily deposits. The second thing I would say is these little doses of kindness served up with big doses of grace. So what that means is being generous in noticing what's going well and offering to assist. Esther Perel, everyone's favorite marriage therapist, says it this way. She reminds couples, and I'm quoting her directly here. Let me first say what I do appreciate about what you do before I dump on you the whole list of stuff that I don't think you do. As we serve up this kindness and affirmation and do so gracefully, then we can talk about the things we need to have done. So it, it's very interesting because we tend to give ourselves a lot of leeway and we tend to not always or as often as we should assume the best intention of our partner. And the third thing is our own self-talk. And I think that this is one of the most under-talked about secret weapons of relationships. It's a sneaky little but powerful thing. And it's so sneaky because we forget that our own self-talk is with us 24-7. We've had it since conception. And the sneaky thing about our minds in marriage is that how we direct our minds has the power to ruin our marriages or propel our marriages to greatness. So we have to change our own narrative as we notice and shift the way we say things to ourselves about our partner about our relationship, we're able to start practicing a, a more positive narrative. A very important tip for couples is if you're in the heat of an argument and you're flooded with emotion, 
taking a break to bring your emotions down, right? To unflood is key. What's key is when you go off to take that break, not only telling your partner, right? I'm going to come back in five minutes after I calm down. But while you're doing whatever you're doing to take the break is noticing how you're talking to yourself. Are you over there taking your break thinking of all the arguments you're going to come back with or about how angry you are or all the things that your spouse did wrong? Or are you going away for that five or 10 minutes or walk around the block and saying to yourself things like, we are on the same team. Let me say out loud to myself three things that my spouse really does do well. I think this is just such a key thing that we're not talking enough about is the notion of how our own narratives profoundly affect how we come to interaction. It's interesting when you say all of these things, because what I think about is we're demonstrating behavior to not only each other, but to ourselves and to the people around us. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that we focus on on Between Over and Next is legacy. I keep thinking about our kids witnessing how we interact with one another. And that becomes so important because that's how they'll learn. Mm -hmm. Because there's no magic big textbook that comes out, how to have a great relationship. It's not like that. It's that accumulation of all of the things that you learn, that you take in shape, that helps make your relationship. So I like to think about what we do as something that we're not only doing for ourselves, but something we're demonstrating to our children. Amen. So this, is how, this is how it's done. And it's funny when we're talking about, you know, secret language, like we always used to joke with the kids that we're going into the bedroom to have a meeting. <laughs> Right, because we See, worked Kevin at home. Knew what we were doing. But we worked at home, so for, for us to say, "Oh, we're having a meeting," and it wasn't until they were probably middle school that they kind of <laughs> got like what, like we're going to have a meeting. And to this day, we still joke with them that we're going to go have a meeting, and they, and they cringe as if they were twelve years old. And it, it's the funniest you know, thing. I love, love, love that you brought that up when you talked about those daily deposits. Particularly with the self-talk, I think it's really important to have self-love mm. and also to be able to exhibit love, whatever your love language is. We both say, I love you to each other a lot and we mean it. So is there something behind that, that saying I love you part? So here's the thing. We all want to know we're loved. I love that both of what you're saying here is going to tie together really neatly here because how our family of origin or the family we grew up in, right? Our family is our first communication classroom. How love was expressed there, not always, but frequently is how we feel most comfortable receiving expressions of love. So it could have been that your parents or grandparents or whomever given their cultural background, given their way of, of being, they expressed love by getting up at 5 a.m. and scraping the snow off your car and filling it up with gas and making sure that every, right? And so it might be hard for that person who now is a partner or a parent to really be verbally expressive, to say, I love you, I love you. What I think is most important for a family and for a marriage is that you're able to meta communicate about what you need in terms of expressions of love. If someone's filling up your car with gas, but you're just like, that's just gas in a car. It doesn't mean anything to me. Over time, you're not going to feel loved. And so I think talking about that is key. How do I feel loved? How do I need to and want to have your love and appreciation expressed to me. Because once you can figure that out, right, then it's like, oh, I see. When it's my birthday, you clean the whole house and go have my car detailed and give the kids breakfast or whatever it is. That means you really love me. Oh, I thought it was just because you like doing those things, right? So 
a lot of couples face the, the, the struggle until they can figure out their love language. What my love language is doesn't mean it's the same way I need to express love to you. I need to figure out what your love language is, how you Listen, are feel loved. It's not one size fits all. I yep. get that. I really do believe a lot of what we're talking about trickles over into other relationships and friendships, not just necessarily partners and couples. Mm -hmm. Can you share a pivotal between over and next moment in your marriage that required change or growth? And how did you navigate that with Brian? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we're all going to face these moments, right? And sometimes you don't know how you're going to handle it. And we had a big one a couple of years ago. And What's really interesting because we have different approaches to how we navigate hard things. And this one we really had to do together, right? I'm the one who needs to like and, and scream and talk to my friends. And he's the one who needs to think quietly and whiteboard about it. And I want to talk to my friends and scream and vent. And he needs to remind me that we have an NDA about this situation. So what we did was we came up with our own little private language. And it was a mantra because it was a very stressful time. And our mantra was, now we know, right? And so when either of us were like kind of spiraling over here or here and it was stressful and there were tears and we we're trying to navigate this together, we would just either hold hands or look at each other or, or just text each other. Now we know, right? Because we knew now what we were dealing with and we had um, a sense that, okay, we, right? We know now. And, and it said so many other things too, that we're going to get through this together. I love looking back and, and seeing how we did it pretty gracefully. Kudos. Thanks to it you. It doesn't always happen that way. Yeah. So let's shift gears for mm -hmm. a moment from personal pivots to professional pivots, because your career has spanned academia. You're a professor, you're a speaker, you're an author. All of these things have made you who you are today. Yeah, it is interesting looking back, which is such an important activity as we look back to look forward. And one of the things I always try to do is surround myself with people who will challenge my thinking and ways of being and whether it's people I know or writers or authors. Maria Popova, who's an author, she, she writes the free blog. I love it. It's called The Marginalian. And one of her posts last year shared her sort of profound life lessons, and she adds another one each year. And there's one that always sticks with me. And I think it, it really does represent my professional pivots over time, especially as I enter this, you know, 33, four years of being a professor, an author, a researcher. And here's what she said. Be generous. Be generous with your time and your resources and with giving credit and especially with your words. It's so much easier being a critic than a celebrator. Always remember there is a human being on the other end of every exchange and behind every cultural artifact being critiqued. And I love this notion because I am as many of my students would tell you, I'm a radical encourager, right? I tend to be very generous with my attributions and my praise and encouraging others. But I've come to this point in my professional career and life to be realizing that generosity is really most pure when it feels like it's stretching you a bit beyond what you feel like you can give. And I'm not saying like empty yourself in service and all that because we have to fill ourselves up. But what I am saying is it's something I wish I knew a bit earlier, right? This wisdom that, for instance, marriage is never 50-50, right? Some days it's 99-1. Some days it's 80-20. But we always have to be as generous as we can with our thoughts and our words and our actions because we're going to need that too. And not only because we're going to need it, but that's been part of my evolution in thinking. It's not protecting as much because I don't like criticism. I like open up the course evaluations, always holding my breath. But 
this notion of being generous has just been a significant professional pivot. I love what you just shared. What advice would you give your younger self knowing you wish you knew this sooner? Like, what is it that you have to be more aware of as a younger person today? That it's all going to work out. The anxiety that our young people feel and the worry and the focus on our curated selves out there in the digital age and when we prioritize relationships, when we prioritize truth and love and generous expressions of affirmation, when we take time to talk to the people and connect with them, see them, when you go to Starbucks or the grocery store and you say to the person checking you out, like, how's your day going? And really want to know the answer. Those are the things that the the best of the best research in the world shows are what will predict our long-term health and longevity and wellness. And so I just wish my younger self knew that and or believed it, right? That it's all, it, it's really so basic. Yeah, belief is powerful. Mm -hmm. And it's not only what you learn in the classroom. It really is a life lesson. So you said digital age. That mm. word says an awful lot. We've got a lot going mm. on now that makes it harder to maintain closer face-to-face -face relationships. I'm grateful we're able to record this <laughs> together with the technology because you're in Minnesota and we're in New Jersey. But what advice do you have for trying to balance that digital and in-person interactions? Mm -hmm. And this is an eight-credit course in itself, but we're going to deep mm. it to 20 seconds. And here's the thing. I I am an optimist, and I think we're at an incredible inflection point um, where, for instance, most parents and grandparents are realizing that, wait a second, maybe my eight-year-old shouldn't have a smartphone. Maybe social media isn't the greatest thing. Um, I'm actually sitting here. It's always with me. Favorite new book, Jonathan Haidt's The Anxious Generation. I think every parent and grandparent and teacher, every adult should read this because it's evidence-based and it gives us solutions. So prioritize face-to-face -face conversation. I mean, this is great. Zoom is great. Phone calls are great when you can't be with people, but we have to prioritize face-to-face -face micro moments where we are with each other because we have a loneliness epidemic. We're not talking to our neighbors. We're doing self-checkout at the grocery store. When we're around the table, we're sitting on our smartphone. And I'm not saying it's the kids or the teens. The adults are even more guilty than the young ones. Teenagers are right. begging their parents for more attention. When in the history yeah, of ever? All the time. All the time. Yeah. We gotta come back to the basics. And the parents and the grandparents and the caregivers were the adults in the room. So we have to create the sacred spaces, whatever that is. No phones in the kitchen, all phones parked on the table. When we're in the car together, no phones. Sit and look out the window. You don't have to talk to me. But kids want that structure. They need it. We're modeling it for them. And it's one of the most important things we can do simultaneous with something we talked about earlier, which is modeling for our kids and our grandkids, the, the littles that look up to us, how to have respectful, loving, equal partnerships within our marriage. And it's be so mindful and intentional. Those rules do need to be made Just about putting the phone away wherever you are and or making those plans to be in person whenever you can. It is so meaningful. So what's next for Carol Brees? Are there any upcoming projects you want to share with us that you're excited about? Tell us what's next. What's next? Well, I am working on a huge book project. It's been five years in the making. I can't say a lot about it right now, but 
in one year from now, people should have it in their hands. It's with a team of people that I have the, the great opportunity to, to lead. It's inspired by a young woman who died in a car accident way too young, but lived a life, her short life, one filled with art and empathy and dialogue across difference. And so one of my commitments at this phase of life is to help bring people into dialogue where there has been great difference, whether it's political divide, long hurts, estrangement, because I do believe, and Maria Popova, as I was mentioning earlier, shared this wisdom as well, that we have to expect anything worthwhile to take a long time. And even though this book project has been taking a long time, I think it's going to be beautiful and meaningful and it's meant to be inspiring for anyone going through anything. So look for that. And I've been committing myself in our community here to helping us learn how to disagree better because I think we need to do that with empathy and respect and in dialogue and part of that slowing down and wanting to hear people's story, right? Because we all have a story. We are so happy that you shared yours with us today mm -hmm. and you enlightened us. And we can't wait for our listeners and viewers to tune in and to know Carol Brees the way we know you. I am just honored to be here again and to see you both after all these years. And thank you for doing this work. It's such a gift. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're um, really grateful. And we look forward to having you back when you do release the next book. <laughs> <laughs> you can count on it. I will respond to those emails. Oh, great. Be well, we everyone. Appreciate and, you. And best in your relationships. Thank you so much, Carol. <laughs> Didn't you learn a lot? I did. Just when I think I can't learn anything else, I go ahead and I learn some more stuff. I love when we share the things that we also do. There's got to be couples who do those things and don't even realize that they have a ritual that they do. If you go to the dictionary, big book dictionary, to define what a ritual is, what would you say? How many times do you have to do something before it becomes a ritual in your mind? That's a good question. I would say probably 10 times? Yeah, I would say that's probably between 10 and 20 times something would become a ritual. One of the examples she gave is like being in the card store. And I think we've done that. Yeah. I think we've been in the well, card store and said, you know it. what? When... You, okay, I could show you card. 10 cards. Say, Listen, I would buy you this card. I would buy you this card. Right, because those card writers are so smart. Yeah. They say the things that you, but not all cards are something I'd want to give you. There were just no, some of course not. that I would love. And I used to love something that we used to do a lot what? when we went for Shopkicks. Tell everybody what Shopkicks oh, is. Oh, yeah. It was an app that like, we, was one of the only that back then that did it. We're doing it for like 10 years, bro. Maybe longer. Maybe. I'd have to check. But it's one of these apps that you go, you, you earn points. I'm going to put a link. By going in into different stores. And we would go into stores and you would earn points just walking in the store. And you would also earn points scanning items in the stores stores right. some kind of like a uh, like a scavenger hunt but the best part the is these points equal dollars right and we would get gift cards they would Change best buy and the target points. and and wasn't it thousands of dollars uh, yes we said two of us over a thousand dollars we had so much fun doing that yeah it was an adventure and we found the stores that allowed you to get points just by driving past them because the sensor was near their front door so we would drive by in the convertible. Remember, we used to hold the, the phone up. Another thing I was thinking that Carol said that I really like, and it really was something that I think all of you should think about, is that NDA with your special someone. Mm -hmm. There were some things that just need to, like, stay in H2. Yeah, of course. And no matter what things look like on the outside, who really knows what's going on behind closed doors? Right. I think as you grow as a couple, there becomes a deeper understanding of what the, the boundaries are. There's nothing that's off limits between the two of us and what we can talk about with each other. 
I don't think anyone should hold anything in, but I do think it has to be in context. I think it has to be reasonable. And I, I love the daily deposits that she talked about. That was vital, key information. But the other thing is agreeing to disagree, which is going to be in her new book, right? She said that I mean, that's one couple? of the subjects. Well, sure. I mean, aren't you suspect of couples that say, we never fight? Respectfully right. agreeing to disagree or to at least kind of explore why you really feel that way to have a better understanding. Well, how is there any growth if there's no conflict, like a disagreement about something, then how do you come to any resolution about anything? You know what I mean? It should never always be smooth sailing. If you learn how to deal with conflict with one another, then you'll be better prepared to deal with conflict with other people. So it's kind of like you can practice with your spouse when in getting better at things and then take it out to the world. It carries over to family. Like I've told our kids a million times, no one will have your back like we have your back. You don't even have to think about that. It's, when I say that to you, like there's no one who will protect you like I protect you, I, period. You get me and I am so thankful for that. It's a great opportunity to share this episode with the people in your lives. For those that want long, strong, relationships with deeper connections. And I will have links to Carol's books and resources that she mentioned and cited because I think that they are worthy of your time to check them out. I am going to be getting that book, The Anxious Generation, because I do believe that we do live in that generation and we oh, want sure. to be a part of that solution to minimize it. And I know that we are stronger and better together. Everybody can benefit from listening to this episode and learning more about themselves and their relationships with others. I agree. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in to this episode of Between Over and Next. We appreciate you being here, and we will see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to Between Over and Next. We hope you enjoyed this episode and found it meaningful and insightful. If you value it to be worthwhile, please share it with your friends and family. We would really appreciate it if you could take a moment to write a review for us. Your feedback will help us continue to create content that resonates with you. And don't forget, in the show notes, you can find all the relevant links mentioned in this episode, from accessing free downloads to visiting our website and more. If you have any questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. Simply send us an email. Our email address is hello at hollyandrobert.com. We're always excited to connect with our listeners. So until next time, thank you again for joining us on Between Over and Next. Thank you for listening to Between Over and Next, the podcast that navigates the twists and turns of life with courage, laughter, and a whole lot of inspiration. Tune in every Tuesday to hang out with Holly and Robert on your favorite podcast platform. Visit hollyandrobert.com and follow them on social media to ignite your passion and fuel your dreams.